I found complementary therapies a big help in my treatment and recovery and helped me cope better with the side effects from chemo and radiotherapy. And I know my mental state was much more positive because I felt like I was taking charge of my treatment. Most importantly, I was taking action to prevent the cancer from coming back. Don't forget a good diet and plenty of the right exercise when you're giving your body the weapons to fight your cancer. I'm not an exercise junkie. I don't even, I don't think I've ever seen a gym, so. <laughs> but I've gone walking, I love walking. I've actually bought a dog, which I'm not an animal person, but I absolutely adore him and he helps me go walking and make sure I do walk. Um, eating wise, yes, we do eat. Um, we were eating healthy before. I wouldn't say that we have, you know, an unhealthy diet, but I'm more conscious now of or getting organic foods, um, eating less junk food, drinking more, all of the things that we probably should have all been doing anyway, but perhaps more so now I'm a bit more conscious of what I'm eating, where the food's coming from. Integrative medicine is a form of medicine uh, where a doctor integrates various elements of healthcare. So the best that conventional medicine has to offer, but also evidence-based complementary therapies, uh, a big emphasis on lifestyle, and also the um, used in a holistic sort of approach. So it's not just about treating the body, uh, the mental and emotional health matters as well, social, spiritual, uh, all of these facets of our existence are really important environment. So it's in a much more holistic sort of model. So that would be the ideal of what integrative medicine is. The responsible use of complementary therapies in cancer management uh, it could be divided into a few areas. When people think oh, I'll use a complementary therapy, many assume, well, it's going to improve survival. Um, but many um, therapies that get approved for cancer or recommended for cancer patients have more been from, in terms of the research support, that they help to improve symptoms or improve coping or help a person's quality of life. Massage, for example, acupuncture for pain um, can, can be used. Um, meditation, relaxation techniques, um, uh, for example, can help with pain and symptom control and, and mood, etc. So there's a whole range of well-established evidence-based complementary therapies that, that can help in that area. In terms of the research uh, of complementary therapies improving survival, that well, there's lifestyle things that people often go to a complementary practitioner to get advice about. They're clearly beneficial. But uh, in terms of the um, other therapies, you know, herbal treatments and supplements and things like that improving survival, there's less research. There's certainly some promising evidence in, in a few examples uh, here and there that are coming through and looking good. But um, there's not really definitive evidence that we can say, all right, well, this, this improves survival by that much. So a person needs to be clear what they're using something for and then they're not thinking they're using it for one reason. Um, where it's actually not going to provide what a person expects. We teach our students here who are coming through to be a new generation of doctors uh, about a holistic approach to preventing or managing a whole range of illnesses including cancer. We talk about the essence of managing cancer. And essence is an acronym that stands for education, stress management, spirituality, exercise, nutrition, connectedness, so that's our social support, and environment. So we look at each of those things and uh, well, what um, would be important under those headings for people with cancer. All of those factors, if you like, the essence of managing cancer, should be used in conjunction with the best cancer care that we can get. And if that's a combination that's being used, then it's a much more powerful combination than one or the other by itself. Uh, there are some safety issues and uh, other issues that if a person's going to be using complementary um, therapies and seeing complementary practitioners, there are a few issues that one would need to think of to know what their qualifications are, uh, to know that they're happy to dialogue with doctors so that they're not going to reject conventional health care because it's always a concern that somebody, if they're going to um, uh, see other practitioners that maybe they're going to reject evidence-based conventional health care, which is, would not be a good approach at all. 
Sometimes people can make uh, unsafe decisions. Sometimes um, the more expensive a therapy is, the more my antennae go up. Our uh, concerns that people could be taken advantage of or their families. And um, so we need to be, that the, the vast majority of uh, things that have been found to be helpful, and certainly lifestyle factors are very low cost, <clears throat> very common sense, and very widely available. So if something is, um, you know, promised as an exclusive um, mystery, um, but expensive cure, then one really needs to proceed with caution and uh, get advice about that. So I think that um, they're perhaps some of the things that one would need to um, think about and when getting sources of information, making sure it's from reputable uh, sources, some cancer websites, for example, um, or organisations have got good information. The Cancer Council's increasing the amount of information it's giving in this area, but more could be provided. Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute. Um, uh, the PubMed, for example, if you Google PubMed, you can go there and you can get information on studies on just about anything. But sifting through this information is often not easy. So I think that, that opening up the dialogue between you know, the patient and the practitioner is, is really important. A cancer diet is different to a general diet that we recommend to the population. Um, we recommend patients, well our aim is obviously to maintain weight and muscle strength during chemotherapy. When you're having chemotherapy or cancer treatment, your body is burning a lot more calories and energy, even though you're not really doing much. Um, so therefore we have to increase the sugar, the fat and the calories that we eat to maintain our weight and muscle strength. The general population, we recommend that they have a high fibre diet, low fat and low sugar diet. But when you're having cancer treatment, we really recommend that you add extra fats and oils and sugars to the food you eat. So for example, we'd be looking at adding margarine or cream to your mashed potato and that's not a common recommendation for the population or we would be encouraging them to eat regular meals, six to eight small meals a day rather than just having the standard three meals a day. We encourage high energy snacks like lollies, nuts, full cream dairy products such as yogurts to get the calories in. So it is very different to a normal general population diet. If people are suffering symptoms like diarrhoea, then we'd encourage a low fibre diet. So your diet does change based on the symptoms that you're experiencing during cancer treatment and it's different from the general population. Many patients come and see me with their family and friends to find out about diet during their cancer treatment. Assistance and support is important during cancer treatment when it comes to food. If people can help out with meal preparation, that is fantastic because preparing food can be a tedious task and the smell of food can also put patients off eating. We encourage patients to walk and not be in the room when patients' foods is being prepared. The best way to help with this is having pre-made meals, so frozen meals in the freezer. Also buying canned soups or buying frozen meals is a great way to help prevent the need to prepare food all the time. Um, in terms of if you're struggling with um, meal pre preparation and you don't have any support, there are many um, companies who can help um, prepare meals for you. Meals on Wheels is a great source, but your doctors and the Cancer Council can also make recommendations of meal providers in your area. Many patients may suffer certain symptoms at certain stages of their treatment, so they may experience a dry mouth or problems swallowing after their first cycle, but may not experience it after cycle five. So it's therefore really important to talk to nursing staff and your dietitian about the symptoms when you're experiencing them. Dry mouth is a common symptom that patients suffer um, whilst they're having cancer treatments. It's a lack of saliva production and therefore makes chewing and swallowing foods such as breads and cereals and meat difficult when you have a dry mouth. We encourage um, patients to drink, have a drink with their meals when they're suffering a dry mouth because it can help facilitate um, swallowing effectively. So have a glass of juice or a glass of milk with your meals. Um, we also encourage patients to choose foods which are softer 
and also more fluid based. So instead of having a, a T-bone steak, have a stew or a casserole with the gravies and the sauces to help you swallow when you have a dry mouth. Um, you may also find that sucking on lollies before you eat meals will help facilitate the saliva production in your mouth and therefore make um, swallowing easier when you're having your main meals. If you really are struggling, then discuss it with your nursing staff because there are artificial um, saliva products or potential mouth washes that can help um, um, facilitate and lubricate your mouth before you eat. Lots of patients also find that they experience pain when swallowing post their cancer treatments or during their cancer treatments. And it's a feeling as if hard foods like an inability to chew them, it gets stuck in their esophagus. So what we recommend patients doing is avoiding the hard texture foods. So once again, we'd encourage gravies or casseroles, but lots of patients still find those types of foods hard to chew. Vegetables can also be quite hard to swallow and cause pain on swallowing. And if patients are avoiding certain foods because they can't swallow, that cuts out a huge range of foods. So therefore, a strategy we recommend is vitamising foods. So vitamising or mashing your potato or your vegetables can help um, ease the pain on swallowing. Um, vitamising your meats or making a casserole and vitamising the casserole is a good way to get foods down when you have pain swallowing. Fluids are an also an easy way to get calories in, but also prevent pain on swallowing. So milkshakes, custards, yogurts and ice creams all will be able to be swallowed easily when you've got pain in your throat. So therefore they're the foods that we recommend people choose when they're experiencing pain on swallow. During your cancer treatment, you may get advice from family and friends about certain diets to follow whilst you're undergoing your cancer treatment. It's really important that you discuss these diets with your doctors and dietitians prior to commencing them because they can be low in certain food groups, increasing your risk of infection and muscle loss and also weight loss. So talk to your doctors, be open about what, you're thinking, what sort of diets you're thinking of following and, and work with your doctors and dietitians to developing the best nutrition plan possible. I couldn't get any information really on any exercises that I should do to help me get my arm going. Um, I practiced, I practiced yoga all my life and so I worked out my own regime which was very helpful but I felt that if people could at least be given some um, help in, in what, what they could do, just to sort of start gently. Um, I mean, I took advice, I, I asked my consultant and, and, and he said, well, if you can stand hurting yourself that much, he said, do it, and if it hurts too much, well then you'll stop and you won't do yourself any harm, which I suppose, I suppose was good advice. Uh, the importance of exercise really can't be uh, overstated. Um, We've known for a very long time, there's been decades of research gathering to suggest that exercise prevents cancer, but what's been really interesting in the last few years have been studies on people who already have cancer and looking at whether or not exercise makes a difference to uh, recurrence and survival rates. And the studies that have been completed so far, high quality studies with large groups of people have shown that uh, roughly a halving of mortality rates over five to up to 18 years follow up for cancer patients, breast cancer, bowel cancer, prostate cancer, you know, common cancers, if a person exercises regularly, not having to become a, um, uh, a marathon runner, but just the, the kind of level of that half hour of brisk walking, or if somebody's a bit younger, maybe something a bit more vigorous, um, on a six or seven days a week. That kind of level of exercise, moderate levels of exercise, has significantly improved uh, outcomes but also the side effects of exercise are important as well. So it helps with pain management, it helps with mood and anxiety, helps to improve sleep. That is the side effects of exercise, and there are many more, are very good. So anybody wanting to prevent, and certainly anybody wanting to manage their cancer, really needs to put exercise right up the front of the list. When cancer patients undergo treatment, it's important that they maintain the physical activity level. 
Quite often the perception out there is that it's important to rest, so stay in bed or lay on the couch all day long to recover. When in fact the research is saying that if someone goes out there and maintains their physical activity level, it can help to improve symptoms such as pain, nausea, fatigue, weakness and anxiety. Also we're seeing improvements in quality of life and the time spent in hospital also can be reduced by doing some physical activity whilst undergoing treatment. So it's important to maintain your activity level whilst you're going through treatment or whilst you're in hospital. Okay, before undertaking any exercise program, it's important to consult your doctor or exercise physiologist because exercise can actually do harm to a cancer patient because cancer patients have unique needs. So when undertaking an exercise program, we have to think about the risk of infection, the risk of um, dehydration, and the risk of injury. If we undertake an exercise program and we get injured or we get an infection, that can actually compromise our treatment for our cancer. So it's important to get the appropriate advice from the doctor because they can point you in the right direction. As an exercise physiologist, I often get asked, how much exercise can I do whilst undergoing treatment? Now it's important as a patient to be aware of how your body feels and what is the right intensity, duration and frequency of exercise. Now while someone's undergoing treatment, it's important to do no more than 30 minutes of activity. Also, it needs to be at a moderate level of intensity. So when we talk about moderate, it means that we're finding it a little bit difficult to talk whilst we're walking and our heart rate's increased a little bit. We also need to think about things like infection. So staying away from crowded gyms and being safe with our activity so we're not causing injury or harm. Cancer patients often find it daunting to go to the gym. They can be a little bit intimidated because they might look a little bit different or their function might not be quite what it used to be. So it's important if they don't want to go to a gym that they maintain their physical activity level. So doing 30 minutes of activity. Also it's important to do incidental exercise. So parking your car a little bit further away from work, walking upstairs and maintaining your walking distance throughout the week. Maintaining your activity level will help to improve your physical function. If you're a cancer patient and you're looking for good advice on exercise prescription, you can contact an exercise physiologist. An exercise physiologist is someone who's university trained in the treatment of chronic disease. So they can prescribe the appropriate intensity, duration and frequency of exercise for your needs. If you're looking to get in contact with an exercise physiologist, you can find one close to you on the ACE website and that's available through the Cancer Council helpline. If you'd like to find out more about this chapter, please use the resources on this page.